Welcome to Christ the Center, Doctrine for Life, your weekly conversation of Reformed Theology. My name is Camden Busey, and uh, this is our weekly discussion in which we're going to deal with all sorts of issues, uh, but today we're going to be focusing on Christians practicing in law. Uh, We've talked about the role of the law in civil governments on our Christ and Culture series uh, last spring, but today we're actually going to speak with somebody who knows what they're talking about, somebody who actually practices law. So let me introduce first our regular... Uh, it was Jared Oliphant, who is Director of Admissions at Westminster Theological Seminary. Welcome back, Jared. Thanks, Camden. Good to be here. And we're also very pleased to welcome James Sweet, who is a practicing lawyer. We're going to get into his bio and describe his firm and his uh, accomplishments. Um, and he is also on the board here at Westminster Theological Seminary, so he has some involvement and experience not only in the, the law world, but also in the theological world. So welcome to the program, Jim. It's great to have you. Thank you, Camden. Delighted to be here, but a quick correction. I'm not yet on the board. Not yet. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> we not, don't want to be presumptuous. And actually probably not going to be on the board, um, given the fact that I represent the university or the seminary and all things legal, it wouldn't make sense for me to be on the board. Yes. So if, I'm, a, I'm a still not even an employee of the seminary. I am an independent contractor but I do advise the board. Have you been given a title, Director of Special Programs? That is correct. I am uh, counsel and Director of Special Projects here at Westminster, and I have been for about four and a half years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, thank you for that correction. And uh, we're very pleased to have you. And I should mention, we are very grateful, uh, not only for all the work that uh, Mr. Sweet has done for the seminary, but also for our organization, Reform Forum. Jim is instrumental in helping us to incorporate and also to help prepare our uh, 501c3 forms, our IRS form 1023, which is in the hands of the federal government. And so we are uh, (laughs) awaiting uh, their mercy. Don't Uh, hold your breath. (laughs) (laughs) But at some point, hopefully in the next few months, uh, we will be uh, recognized as a tax-exempt organization, which would mean a lot for our um, organization in terms of our development and our abilities to move forward in uh, our ministry. So uh, if you're able, please pray for that and uh, welcome or join us in thanking Jim for his help in helping us to get all that finished. I certainly couldn't have done it myself. Well, you're welcome, Camden. It's a wonderful website. I've just gotten uh, even more familiar with it over the past uh, couple of days after you guys asked me to come on here and chat. And you know, check listen, us out. <laughs> listening to Christ the Center and all of the, uh, all of the resources, it's a remarkable website for being so young. Well, thank you. We Not you it. young, the website. Yeah, the website, <laughs> three, three, four years old. Yeah, thank you very much for that. And uh, as we get started, I should mention, uh, because it's apropos, given what we've just uh, spoken about, that Christ the Center and uh, all of Reform Forum is listener-supported, and we rely on the generous donations and also prayers of all of our listeners and viewers. So if you were able to help us out, please visit us today at reformedforum.org slash donate and help to continue uh, supporting uh, our ministry here so that we can distribute and also produce all of our programs and get them out into the hands of people that need to hear them. Jared, do we have any other announcements uh, or any bits of news that we'd like to mention uh, yeah. as we get started? Just one quick thing that I've hit on before, but just a little bit more specifically. Um, at Just after this airs, um, we have a full confidence conference in Vancouver, Canada on uh, the weekend of March 25th, and that's going to be at Faith Presbyterian Church in Vancouver. And uh, Dr. Lubeck is going to spe- be speaking. Dr. David Garner is going to be speaking. John Curry is going to be speaking. And then uh, the next weekend after that, we're going to continue in Canada, and we'll be at Edmonton. Mm. Um, and that's at Crestwood. Gretzky Crestwood. Land. Yeah, right. <laughs> in hockey country. Um, and uh, Dr. Lane Tipton is going to be speaking, Dr. Dave Garner. So we have some good events coming up uh, if you're even remotely in that area. Mm. Yeah, here Alberta's beautiful, and uh, the farm country, and of course, uh, hockey country, and the home of the great one, Yeah, uh, before he moved on to bigger and greater things with other teams, but it should be really exciting. Yeah, James Dolezal, people might be interested to know, um, one of our regulars uh, used to uh, pastor in Alberta. I didn't know that. Yeah, and so uh, he has some experience up there, so we know there is a Dutch influence and a, and a solid Reformed influence in that province in Canada. Yeah, and John Curry is uh, somewhat of a native from there, too. So he's getting <laughs> back to the old country, the motherland. We, we could officially call him a U.S. citizen, but he was he's a Scottish citizen who lived in Canada for many years and now yeah. is an American. Yeah, so. he's an alien all the way around. But, <laughs> but a good guy. In many different ways. Yeah. 
<laughs> well, uh, if that's all for today in terms of the news, we should get right into our uh, prime discussion, which is that of the Christian's involvement in law. And when I say practicing law, we're not speaking of it in the sense of law gospel. We're speaking of it in the sense of civil governments, uh, civil law, and also criminal law, trying to understand how a Christian should go about living in their world. We're going to try to get at the presuppositions and the foundations of law, how the Bible provides for a civil government, and how that can be ordered, structured, and regulated by a law that is instituted by the people. We can talk about the authority and who who should wield it, and also speak about how a Christian should go about not only living in their society and abiding by the law, but also practicing the law and maybe even shaping and forming it through the appropriate channels. So, uh, Mr. Sweet, uh, could you describe a little bit and give us a, a biographical sketch of yourself? You've had such a storied career. Can you speak about your firm and some of the maybe higher profile cases that you've sure. been involved in so people have a context of sure. who they're listening to? <clears throat> but as I said to Karen Bishop the other day, if you call me Mr. Sweet one more time, I'm <laughs> out of here. <laughs> well, I hope Jim's okay. We'll yeah, call you Jim. Jim's, Jim's just great. <laughs> um, I am... Uh, One month away from full-time Medicare, which is really full-time Social Security. So I'm almost 66 years old. Next month, I'm turning 66. So I was one of those uh, post-war babies. I was born uh, in Detroit, and I've never forgiven my mother for that (laughs) because I only lived there two days before we went back home to Minneapolis. My father was drafted, and he was sent pretty quickly to Europe, so... um, so I uh, I was born in Minneapolis, raised in Minneapolis, a hockey player, as you know, Camden. Yeah. Uh, moved to Chicago. There we go. Um, went to high school, then stayed in town, went to Wheaton College for um, four years, graduated in 67, got drafted, as many of my classmates were in 1967, and rather than give the Army my body for two or three years, I joined the Navy. So I spent three years in the Navy. Um, Came back and I went to law school in the fall of 1970 at the College of William and Mary. Yeah. Went there because my wife had always wanted to live in Williamsburg, and I owed it to her because we really didn't have a a terrific uh, um, uh, honeymoon because of the fact that we were, I was drafted almost immediately and we got married while she was still in college. So anyway, she wanted to live in Williamsburg. I said, what a great place to live. So we went to William and Mary, graduated in 1973 and moved to Philadelphia took the only professional job before this one at Westminster that I've ever had, and that was with the law firm of Drinker, Biddle, and Wreath in 1973, and stayed there 32 years till yeah. 2005, to the day, actually. Wow, years congratulations. Wow. And on, uh, sometime in the uh, summer of uh, 2005, I had been the chairman of the firm for five-plus years, and sometime that summer I just said, this is enough fun, I want to do something a little more kingdom-directed. Mm-hmm. And so after eight and a, eight plus years in management of chairing the litigation practice and then chairing the firm, and in about April or May of 2005, I uh, decided to leave the firm, step down as chairman, and then my wife and I went to the south of France. And if you're going to think about changing careers, don't go to the south of France <laughs> because you will change careers. You absolutely will. So I did. I came back and I gave the firm notice and said, I really think it's time for me to do something else. So here I am. You're here on the campus. Yeah, here I am. Uh, So that was in uh, September 1st of 2005, and I've never looked back. um, I really love being here, and I had no plans on being here when I stepped down. I I couldn't have found Westminster uh, on the map. (laughs) I knew very little about it other than the fact that in Williamsburg, we were the third and fourth attendees at the Westminster Orthodox Presbyterian Church, which was a newfound plant by a recent Westminster grad named Mort Whitman. Oh, wow. <laughs> so even though I was a Wheaton grad, I knew nothing about the Reformed faith. Wheaton's a broadly evangelical mm-hmm. school, as you know, but it's mm-hmm. not a Reformed school in any real sense. So Mort Whitman um, planted uh, Westminster Orthodox Presbyterian Church in the fall of 1970, or 69, I guess, and he had somehow gotten two people to come before in, in the first year. And then in the second year, my wife and I were the third and the fourth or the fifth <laughs> and the sixth. I don't remember. But significantly, the first and second were Reggie Kidd, who oh, teaches yeah. New Testament yeah. at um, RTS, right? RTS yeah. and is a long, long time friend. And the other was a fellow named Lem Tucker, who also came here and went to a seminary 
went then went down and worked with John Perkins at Voice of Calvary in uh, Mississippi and died a very early and tragic death of uh, some type of leukemia. But those were members one and two, both re- both ultimately Westminster students, mm-hmm. and my wife and I mm-hmm. joined, and we had a nice little fellowship of about 20 over the course of three years. So I became uh, familiar with the Reformed mm-hmm. gospel mm-hmm. at Westminster Orthodox Presbyterian Church well, that's in Williamsburg, great. Virginia. Yeah, it's fantastic. So... Um, now, what are some of the cases you've worked on? Before we get into the idea of, um, you mentioned a kingdom perspective and wanting to do more of that, and we'd like to get into the intricacies of actually practicing law and uh, doing it self-consciously as a Christian and how that's appropriate uh, or can be appropriate. But before that, um, what are some of the cases you worked on and what type of law did you practice? Because there are many different types. It evolved over the course of time from 1973 on my entire career. I was in the litigation practice, so I was what you would call a trial lawyer, although Mm -hmm. trial lawyers are typically uh, thought of as being plaintiff's lawyers. Uh, Trial lawyers can be defendant's lawyers, too. And and a large firm like I was in, it typically was defense-oriented. I started out doing criminal antitrust and securities cases. I did employment cases. Uh, Long before there was such a thing as intellectual property, I tried some high-tech cases, we called them then, but they would clearly be uh, intellectual property cases today, uh-huh. but I think my career can be um, can be uh, summarized by three words: drugs, sludge, and radiation. <laughs> I did drugs, I did sludge, and I did radiation. I rep- not personally, uh, I, yeah, right? <laughs> well, I'll explain that. You, you can draw your own conclusion. All right. <laughs> um, Start and on March twenty eighth, nineteen seventy nine. I remember waking up, hearing the radio go on, and somebody saying, "There's been an accident out at Three Mile Island," which you guys have heard of at least. You yeah, weren't. absolutely. You, you may not have been alive when it happened, but you've heard of it. And I remember thinking, "Boy, that's going to be some some big deal." I wonder who represents <laughs> them. Well, it turns out my firm represented them, and I. <laughs> I got in there early that day for reasons I can't remember, and there was about three messages on my desk of see so-and-so right now. I was a yeah. fairly senior associate in 1979. I, hadn't, I became a partner in the firm in 1980. So um, it turned out to be uh, the next, I guess it would have been 79 to probably 98, so that's 19 years of my life. I spent probably 30 to 40% of my time Representing the owners and operators of Three Mile Island, so, wow. so it was. A, I, I became very familiar, obviously, with um, nuclear reactors and nuclear power and radiation and all those things. So that was the radiation part of my practice. Uh-huh. I did drugs consistently from 1975. <laughs> I represented uh, Merck um, and Johnson and Johnson and others, but primarily in a, a drug products defense. Yeah. So I. Tried cases. A lot of intellectual property there. Yeah, uh, as well. actually, that those weren't the cases I was thinking of, but there is a little, lot of intellectual property there. But they're basically drug injury cases. Yeah, okay. So yeah. I would represent, for example, I had a string of cases representing Johnson & Johnson's sub McNeil, which is right around here in Fort Washington, on their so-called Tylenol alcohol cases. There was uh-huh. an allegation that alcohol potentiated the effects of Tylenol and conjugated it uh, in the liver in a manner that uh, could uh, be a liver destroyer. Yeah. So we did a lot of those, and the whole issue there was do they need to put a warning, an alcohol warning on the label, which I believe is there now ultimately, but I've tried a lot of those cases and dealt with a lot of those and a lot of other types of drug cases. Mm-hmm. It's probably another 25 30% of my practice, and a lot of the rest of my practice was sludge. I was hmm. the king of sludge. <laughs> I represented, uh, back in the 80s and 90s, the major issue, one of the major issues in, in, in America was who's going to clean up the, um, the rivers, the um, polluted harbors, the, um, all of the uh, waste sites and um, Superfund sites. Who's going to pay for that? Is it going to be the people that did it? Or is it going to be their insurers who issued them general liability policies for 40 years? Yeah. And are typically... Uh, accident or occurrence policies uh, and not thought about as something that would cover generally acts that were done intentionally, but the uh, outcome wouldn't have been known. So it was a massive, and it may still be, but in the 90s, in the late 80s and 90s, it was a huge issue. There was, there was major litigation between insurers whom I'm rep- who I represented and polluters as to who would pay. So those were 
That's what I call the sludge part of my practice. So is again, drugs, sludge, radiation. <laughs> easy to remember. <laughs> easy, it easy is. to remember. It's great at cocktail parties, too. What do you do? Well, I do drugs, I do sludge, I do radiation. It's real simple. <laughs> I didn't, Sometimes all at the same time. I, I didn't, I didn't the same need day. to refer to anything to remember what my practice was. <laughs> well, um, I hate to clue you in, but as, as we discuss uh, Christians in law, um, maybe if you're not aware, our culture uh, uses lawyers as the butt of many of its jokes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, I wasn't aware of that, Camden. What, what a novel thought. Yeah. Indeed. Um, in in uh, the apologetics course here, AP 213, which is the second uh, apologetics course that you're required to take, uh, Dr. Oliphant speaks about Thomas Aquinas and what is called the analogia entis, which is the analogy of being. And there are different interpretations of this idea, but uh, if I were to boil it down simplistically, some may disagree, but uh, that there is a chain of being. God is unlimited being, and all other beings descend in some sort of chain of being until you get to the bottom of the chain of being, at which point Dr. Oliphant says you find the lawyers. <laughs> so that's just one uh, theological take on the uh, typical butt of the joke. You well, could insert all sorts of professions well, just, just there. Just one, one short uh, uh, snapshot, and that was when uh, Carl Truman, Dr. Carl Truman, acting in his official capacity, got served with a subpoena to produce documents on behalf of the institution. He called me up in a panic, and he's, of course, a great, the greatest lawyer detractor on campus. <laughs> And uh, I said, well, why, why don't you just call one of your theologians? Why are you calling all of them? I would have <laughs> loved to me. hear that. You need me now. He, said. he called me up and he said, what do I do? What do I do? I said, well, call a theologian. <laughs> <laughs> just pray. <laughs> or pray, yeah. I, I should have. Oh, why didn't yeah. I think of that? Oh. But he said, no, Jim, I, I really need help. What do I do? And I said... Uh, well, we'll figure it out. So and then you work through the issue, course I'm sure. Do. Yeah, but of course, it's not its not a bad thing to leave Dr. Truman hanging once in a no. while, given all the abuse he, he, uh, yeah, he, uh, he, <laughs> he, he shovels a, out himself. He's uh, he, he, he has his issues with lawyers, as we all know, yeah. but that's okay. Now, um, speaking of law in general, um, we're talking about laws that are instituted by men, by governments, but uh, what are the foundations of law why do maybe it's an easy question but why do we need it and uh how do we go about it as as christians what are the foundations well of course u.s law is based upon the common law which has evolved over centuries um in england and it's basically the common law is an is unwritten it's all case law case generated um and it started out essentially is two things, uh, ex contractu and ex delictu, uh, contractual law and tort law. Hmm. And all of our laws have basically come down through our, our heritage as, as, uh, as a British colony, essentially. All of the common law has been imported, and we've, of course, developed our own sense of English common, uh, English common law, and much of it's been codified now. But essentially, our foundations in the law are from the English common law. And each state um, had its own set of laws and has enacted its own set of laws, some of which are different. For example, the laws of New Jersey will be different than the laws of um, uh, Pennsylvania in many ways. Uh, the laws of New Jersey tend to be more progressive than the laws in Pennsylvania. Hmm. Of course, there's, overlaying all of that is the federal system um, of, to which all Americans are subject. So... Uh, and then, of course, there's New Orleans or Louisiana, which has a, a French uh, background. So it's not a common law jurisdiction. It's a it's a, a codified French law jurisdiction. So mm. when you try a case in Louisiana like I have, um, you're, you're, you're met with a whole different set of uh, uh, words and phrases that you're not familiar with, laws that you're not familiar with. In other words, they, they're not... Even though there, there certainly have been inroads, they are not uh, followers of the English common law as the mm -hmm. other 49, sta or, yeah, 49 states are. So it's, mm -hmm. a, it's, it's a mix of things, but I would say foundationally our laws are built upon the English system, which mm -hmm. has been, of course, uh, intact for ever since the Magna Carta when the, uh, well, when the um, landed gentry uh, got uh, King John uh, to... Uh, Assign the Magna Carta, giving them certain rights. It's it's been an evolutionary process. So, so. That's interesting to think about the the history and development of laws and and how they pass from governments to governments. And and uh, when you start to unwrap the onion, so to speak, to peel the layers off, we're we're going to go all the way back to the very beginnings of humanity. 
uh, when God created the the earth. Um, what are some common elements or some general principles? Our, our Declaration of Independence speaks of certain inalienable rights that we have as as human beings. What what are some of those really basic, even philosophical or theological foundations for the idea of a law that should govern uh, the conduct of men? Well, I think it's very interesting. Take the first Ten Amendments, for example, passed at the same time that the Constitution was adopted. So you, you start with uh, the right of free speech, the right against unreasonable searches, the right to a jury by your peers. Terribly important thing because that was not common in England, um, and that was one of the issues that was hugely important to the um, to the colonists that they would not be summoned by the uh, regent uh, or the governor to stand trial. They would have the right to trial by a jury of their peers. Hugely uh, important uh-huh. thing. Uh, again, a right uh, against unreasonable searches and seizures. The uh, Fourth Amendment. Um, uh, the right against self-incrimination. Mm-hmm. Um, the, in in another very important one, it's commonly called the separation of church and state. But of course, those words nowhere appear um, in the Constitution or the uh, any of the amendments. That the, 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 those are judicially <laughs> coined phrases. That's a judicially coined phrase. It's the it's the right to be free in your religious practice, mm-hmm. um, uh, as stated in the First Amendment. So I think those are some of the really important ones that we have. Um, seen come down over time. Mm -hmm. And I can imagine as you're learning law and you're going through law school and even as you're in your practice, uh, of course, there's a huge overlap with ethical issues and and there's systems of ethics. Have you found in in your time as, as, uh, as being a lawyer that you've come to butt heads with people who are coming from different philosophical perspectives? And you as a Christian have a certain understanding of how God created the world and how he's instituted certain certain things, and other people might have a completely different account for right. what is right and what is wrong. Have you found that to be the case? Uh, interesting question, Camden. Um, lawyers are govern- governed by uh, a very uh, strict uh, code of conduct. It's not quite the same in every state, but every state has them, and Pennsylvania has adopt, essentially adopted the so-called model rules, which are the rules of professional conduct, or the RPC. Very detailed in terms of uh, what representation means, to whom you can um, give confidential information, uh, where your duties of loyalty are, what constitutes a conflict of interest. Yeah. Yeah right down to the details of uh, engagement letters and every and everything else. So we're a fairly tightly governed group of people. And every year, to maintain my license, and this is going to be my 39th year of doing this, mm-hmm. I have to go back and take 12 hours, including one hour of ethics, which... 12 hours a year? 12, 12 hours of continuing legal education a year. Actual uh, classroom hours or credit hours? Yeah, classroom okay, hours, not okay. credit hours. Classroom hours. So that's basically say, oh my goodness. <laughs> that's basically two days. Still, uh, uh, two days it takes, and mine's coming up in a couple of weeks. I got to do it. Um, but one of those classes is ethics, and they call eleven of them are substantive in whatever field you want to study in. But one of them is ethics. But I will say that. Lawyers, I think, get a bad reputation, and maybe, maybe, um, perp- maybe so. But um, I, fu- I have found that in most firms, uh, particularly the big firms like mine, and mine was what you would call a classic white shoe firm. It's a hundred. It was founded in eighteen forty nine, so it's a uh, what is that? One hundred and almost one hundred and sixty yeah. some yeah. years old. Sixty two years. Yeah. And in fact, just uh, parenthetically, the fellow. Who represent? Who I have retained to represent the seminary on a number of issues. Um, his name is Bill Bullitt. His great great grandfather, John C. Bullitt, founded the firm in 1849. Wow, so it's been a, it's wow. it's a firm that's been going on for years and years and years. It changed its name to Drinker Biddle and Reith in the um, in 1920, um, wow. when Henry Drinker and uh, Charlie Biddle got together and, and formed the firm. But but ba- but basically. This all has a point, I promise. Um, (laughs) Legal ethics started evolving in the 20s and 30s, um, and and they started evolving literally at Drinker, Biddle, and Wreath for the country. And the reason was 
Henry Drinker, who's the, who's a senior name partner and long dead, um, had an issue with the way law was being practiced in some quarters and by some ethnicities uh, in the city of Philadelphia primarily. Mm. And so he formed, he was named the chairman of the first American Bar Association Committee on Ethics, and for about 30 or 40 years he chaired that committee. When he stepped down, uh, our senior partner at the time, Lou Van Dusen, chaired it for the next 20 years, and when he stepped down, Larry Fox, another partner, chaired it for 10 years. So we've had like 70 or the last 70 years, the chairman of that ABA committee on ethics, or different names, but essentially on ethics, have been drinker lawyers. So Drinker wrote the book in ethics, and Drinker has had this long sort of history of being known for its, uh, uh, well, a poor way to put it, pioneering, but for its really, ethics, though. but its pioneering yeah. work in writing the model rules and having them en- enacted and, all, and running the committee that oversees it. So you grow up in a culture at a place like Drinker that uh, – Ethics are very, it comes with, you bleed the colors and it's kind of in the water. It's uh-huh. in the DNA of the firm. But I would say even beyond a place like Drinker, um, ethics are taken very seriously. And when there is a breach, um, it can be fairly high, um, it can be fairly high profile. Uh-huh. Now, there are always going to be people in any profession that um, that skirt the law, Um I'll never forget uh, an article I saw once in The American Lawyer, which is the rag that many of us read one uh, and then flush down the toilet and do whatever (laughs) we do with it, about a a slip-and-fall lawyer in New York City. Slip-and-fall lawyer. (laughs) The rule in New York was uh, in order to – if if you were claiming a defect in the sidewalk, Uh the hole had to be three inches deep. If it was less than three inches – it wasn't. So what the what the plaint literally what plaintiffs lawyers would do would take uh, would be to take uh, rulers and measure them, uh-huh. and they caught this one guy because he'd made his own ruler, oh. and he'd taken a picture of it. But in fact, it was only two, but it showed five on his ruler. <laughs> I mean, that's the kind of stuff you just can't make up. <laughs> and I remember this is thinking, what they do on uh, fishing websites when yeah. they do, when they show their catch. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's, that's, that's a silly <laughs> little story, but stuff like that does happen. But I, I have found, for the most part, uh, pr- probably more so in the culture that I grew up in at the at Drinker, Biddle, and Reith, that lawyers tend to be very ethical. The chief types of questions you get are conflict questions, and they can be difficult. We represent, con- we represent client X. Can we represent client Y? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, obviously... Not if they're in direct conflict with each other, but in some cases there's such a thing as a waivable conflict. So if if there's a possibility that they may come in conflict later, if both parties assent or consent, you can represent both parties. I see. But um, and typically, you know what I did for you when um, when uh, you asked me to. Do the, uh, the yeah to be on our board, and now you're on our advisory board. And to yeah. write the agreement, Some I said are... the the Westminster is my client, so you will need to give me a written yeah. consent, which of course you did. Yeah, but that that's the place where you most often see ethics come in, and uh-huh. the issue is if you do this for this client, can you do this for that client? Mm-hmm. And think about it: a, a firm like mine probably has ten or fifteen thousand clients. Some of the really large firms maybe have twenty or twenty-five thousand clients. Oh my word! So you have to have a whole group of people. We had about five people that did nothing but did. check conflicts. Mm-hmm. It's their job. Intake, wow. we called it, and all they did was check conflicts against the books. And then we got conflict sheets every morning that we had to read through and. So that's a big part of the practice these days. And that's it's taken mo- seriously. It's, Absolutely. It's taken, mm-hmm. in the large firms, it's taken very, very seriously. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Now, I think it's less of an issue in the conflict if you're a, if you're a solo practitioner, if you're representing um, uh, injured people. You don't generally have those types of conflict issues. You, ha- you may have different types of issues, uh, but you don't have that type of issue. Yeah. Is that is that a good start? Yeah. yeah. We yeah. start talking about that and we can we can uh further plumb the idea of of conflicts and and perhaps uh down the road I'll, I'll let Jared speak here but uh we could speak about um even conflicts that might arise if we're put in a sort of a predicament yeah. when we're demanded from 
the firm or, or by the law to do one thing where it might where sometimes it might even come into conflict with our Christian convictions. But Jared. Yeah. Um, wanted to ask a related kind of an underlying question. Um, I went I worked with a guy who is in law school and this was just after coming out of seminary, graduating from seminary. And it struck me how um, what I did sometimes in seminary in um, hermeneutics and interpreting scripture, there's somewhat of a parallel um, with with legal work in that there is there's a canon of information there's interpreting that um, you know and even in the philosophical world there's you know evidences that you're looking at and there's a case that you're that you're making I guess the question is have you taken some of those skills that you've learned in the legal world and um, being involved in a theological uh, seminary are, are there par- parallels that you see, and, and can you apply those um, to the theological arena in ways that maybe we can't see initially? Yeah, that's um, great. And even in sitting in the ethics class that, that you're doing, um, how those things are related? Wow, ethics class is very stimulating. Um, when they, they, I didn't realize the rule was that you only put verses up on the board in Greek and Hebrew, so I'm, <laughs> I'm right away I'm dead. Um, we it's do very love that. difficult. <laughs> uh, that's an interesting question, and I, I guess I would answer it this way. Uh, when I started practicing, there was no Lexus or Nexus, no online search, no computers. Mm-hmm. There was no computers. There was no. We did typewriter. I'm sounding like a really old guy. I guess I am, but <laughs> but we did typewriters in in seven carbon papers. Oh, uh, wow. that's how old. And uh, there was. I'm not even sure there was a Xerox. Well, maybe early Xerox machines, but see. The whole notion of legal research, everything now is done the same way we do it here. Uh, the books are there and they're nice, but uh, legal research is essentially done online. So mm-hmm. I can find anything I need now online. used to be that libraries were hugely important, and you'd go into the library and you'd find a book. And, and to see if that case was still good, for example, if you read a Supreme Court case that in 1965, to see if that case was still good law, you would have to go to a, se- a second book called a Shepherd's and shepherdize it, which would tell you right up to the minute or up to the week whether that case was still good law. So you'd so read Norman the... Shepherd. Uh, no. It wasn't Norman <laughs> Shepherd. No. Shepherd. No. The Shepherd Leader by yeah. Whitmer. I heard Shepherd. Gonna, yeah, I no, gotta jump uh, out. These are dumb theological. Yeah, no, I, I'm familiar with a shepherd guy. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, um, it sounds so laborious. I mean, it, it, it was must very laborious. <laughs> it, was, it was unbelievably laborious. That's why they had. This associates. is why you have oh, it was paralegals brutal. or nice. assistants yeah. and all sorts of other it people. Was, it was brutal, but but so that has evolved uh, uh, to the uh, to the point where when my firm moved about um, the first year I became chairman, we moved, and I I questioned whether we should even build a library. Well, we built a lovely library. It's very pretty. I don't. We ha- we hold receptions in there. At least that's what we were doing when I left. I don't know what else they do. Very few people go in there because everything you need is at your fingertips. Now, I don't know if that's the same way it is in the in in the seminary. To come right down to the question now that I've been blathering on, I don't know if it's the same because what I am doing, I'm simply auditing the ethics class at this point. Yeah. So I'm not going out and doing any independent research. So I, I just don't know if there's a carryover there in study methods. I will say that there certainly is a carryover in the legal work that I do for the seminary. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I do all sorts of things for the mm-hmm. seminary. I do, um, I do the copyright work. I do the publications work. I do trademark work. Uh, personnel work, contracts, mm-hmm. um, you name it. Mm-hmm. Uh, I do that, and much of the information that I need to do it, I can find on site, or I can make a call to one of my former colleagues, um, whom the seminary has retained to, to help me with the things that um, I'm not competent on. Yeah, so I'm not sure that answers your question, but I, do, I, I guess the short answer is I don't. I, I'm not sure that there's a uh, that there's a clean uh, uh, over overlay in this okay. in law and the seminary studies. One one way, kind of simply, that I can ask it is. Um, uh, does does a lawyer uh, read scripture in a way that's articulately different from, you know, someone else who may not have the same kind of background and skills? I see. That's that's a very interesting uh, question. I've seen tremendous scripture parsing in the good sense here, uh-huh. um, and lawyers do exactly the same. Right. Thing. Right. Okay. They that's parse. Nice. They parse words very carefully. 
Um, my wife often says to me, you're thinking like a lawyer and talking like a lawyer again, would you quit it? And I said, <laughs> come on, that's all I am. It's the only thing I know. But we do tend to be very careful um, about what we say in certain issues, just like a theologian would be. I'd say much hmm. more so than is common um, typically, uh, yeah. because words matter, uh, nuances matter, etc. One of the things uh, that often comes up uh, when it's time to nominate a new Supreme Court justice is their position on the law or their approach. You hear of liberal judges and and conservative judges or constitutionalists. I mean, really what's going on is a matter of hermeneutics. Mm -hmm. And um, I find it fascinating the um, differences of opinion that come up. I recall several years ago when when, uh, Senator Kennedy was still alive and and he was speaking in behalf of – I forget the justice name, but you can remind me. But uh, it, w- it was maybe maybe five years ago. And um, defending this idea of a progressive approach to law in which the judge will... He was defending the idea of, in a sense, legislating for the bench or updating the law for today's culture. And so we have, in, in law, the same types of issues we have in yeah. people approaching uh, the Bible. Dif- you have different ideas of what a text means or what its meaning is for today or how we are supposed to treat it. Um, could you speak to that just sure. in, in terms of how you might go, how you might practice yourself or how you might hire people for your firm or how you might support or not support a particular judge based on their hermeneutic? And it depends on what your definition of is is. <laughs> well, <laughs> th- there, he's a lawyer too. President That's Clinton. why I brought it up. And, well, and there he, are different he's is's. Disbarred, but he, he, he is law, law trained, shall we say. Yeah. But there are, you know, yeah, there, there's you're something right. to it. Yeah, you're right. That's a, a very interesting question because the fight today is between the so-called originalists, the Scalia wing of the court, uh, yeah. which generally is sought mm. to compose Alito, Scalia, Roberts, and Clarence Thomas, uh-huh. and the living constitution or something yes. Yes. Uh, group, which uh, uh, Ginsburg and Sotomayor and uh, Stephen Breyer and, well, John Paul Stevens was, um, and David Souter also came out of that mold. Um, and, and the really f- interesting point is many constitutional issues are decided by one person today. Oh, yeah. Do you know who that is? Justice Anthony Kennedy. Yeah. Who's the so-called swing vote, just like uh, Justice wow. O'Connor. O'Connor was, was for so many swing years. swing vote for years. So uh-huh. the, 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 the thinking is that if Obamacare is is uh, unconstitutional, it's going to be five to four, and it's going to be uh, uh, Justice Kennedy writing. And if it's constitutional, it's going to be five to four, and it's going to be probably Justice Chief Justice Roberts, because in the Supreme Court, the uh, Chief Justice uh, has the power to assign the opinion if he's in the if he's in the majority. If he's in the majority, and okay. I think the senior minority justice assigns the opinion otherwise. But coming back to the whole notion of originalism versus um, a living constitution, it's a very interesting uh, dynamic right now. And the what you, what you hear from the, um, uh, the the liberal side and the progressive side is that the world's changed in 220 years. We cannot simply take the constitution literally as as you originalists want to take it. Um, we need, it needs to grow and expand and adapt to the times. And, of course, on the other side, you get the argument, that's judge-making law. Yeah, we and, have a legislative branch. Yeah, we have a legislative branch. You guys aren't the legislative. We're not the legislative branch. Uh, we are here to interpret the laws made by the legislature. And you can see, for, for example, in the Commerce Clause, uh, what's happened in the, in the oh, recent years. Um, yeah. The Commerce Clause... Since since the 1930s and the New Deal has been stretched beyond all recognition. Originally, the Commerce Clause was to represent to uh, to uh, to regulate commerce between the states with a foreign country and thirdly with the Indian tribes. <laughs> That's what it says. Yeah. Now, it's fine to have judicial gloss and all, but to the point where now we are being told uh, that we have to buy a product, which of course is the current state of the mandate under Obamacare, that's as far as uh, the Commerce Clause has ever been stretched by far. It takes it beyond anywhere it's ever been. In fact, one of the judges, uh, Judge Gladys Kessler, I think is her name, who, uh, uh, who found Obamacare constitutional, one of the two or three that did, and there's two that didn't, I think, 
She said, uh, it shouldn't depend on whether there's an activity or a non-activity because engaging in a non-activity is mental activity, quote unquote. Hmm. And the Commerce Clause governs mental activity. Huh. So there's the interesting sort of uh, dynamic, originalists versus um, uh, living constitutions. Now, nobody's a true originalist, and nobody believes you should just ignore the, co- the, the, the Constitution either. Yeah, so the issue is where in, those, where in that, that, uh, that line do you come? A, a guy like Scalia would be pretty far over to the right in that line, and somebody like uh, Anthony Kennedy, who's considered the swing vote, would probably be in that camp but would be much further to the left. Now, have line. you found your own Christian convictions and your understanding of what a text is or, or what its authority is or where it lies? Do you find your Christian convictions impacting your understanding of how we approach uh, legal texts? No, you know, I don't. I, I, I know uh, a number of, of uh, Christian lawyers who uh, tend to be on the liberal side. Really? Uh, and I know, so I don't think how you interpret the Constitution itself is a Christian issue. For me, um, it's much more a constitutional um, uh, issue of executive, judiciary, judiciary, yeah, right. and uh, legislative, and it's a usurpation of powers issue to me. It's not. It's not a. It's not a, uh, a biblical or a religious issue. So you find it uh, more of a, a pragmatic issue. Then I'm trying to get at how you approach mm-hmm. texts. Do you find that when you approach or you have a certain hermeneutic? Do you find personally that you can have a certain hermeneutic in the practice of law and then a different one when you approach your scripture? Or is the science of interpretation or the principles of interpretation, do you find the same in both cases? That's pretty smart. <laughs> just, uh, You're honest, leading me in the right question. direction, and, you, I, and I hadn't thought about it. A uh, quite... leading question, Your Honor? No, I, I asked an uh, it, it's it wasn't an honest a leading, question. It wasn't a leading question, actually. A leading <laughs> question is one that suggests an answer, and that didn't suggest an answer. <laughs> um, I stand corrected. Uh, that's technically what a leading question is. <laughs> so um, I win that well, my can, defense. Yeah, can I weigh? I mean, there there are different you know standards, right? Because you're, one's interpreting scripture, one is interpreting constitution, which is an, that's an the question. Or I'm not. Yeah, yeah, I really wasn't trying to. But it's a yeah, hermeneutic. No, that's a very that's a, that's an excellent curiously point. interesting. Uh, uh, yeah. I want to think about it, but off the top of my head, I think my uh, hermeneutic, my biblical hermeneutic, uh, would persuade me. On the uh, on way to, I interpret, I think it would. Hmm. Um, in terms of the principles of how you do it, I'm not saying that you that yeah. it, when you're trying a case, you necessarily look for you know a case law in scripture. You're, it's probably not that <laughs> no. blunt. But the idea that you approach the text in a certain way, the, your principles for interpretation, you're, you're saying are, are probably the same, I, I or think, at least would impact. Yeah. Of course, you've got the the inspired and inerrant Word of God in one hand. So you. So it's you, fundamentally you, different. It's fundamentally yeah. different, but you do a. a uh, you do. I have a high view of scripture, yeah. much higher now <laughs> since I've been here than I did before. But I've always had a high view. But I mm-hmm. think I, I think the Constitution is such an utterly remarkable document and so yeah. well thought out that I have a high view of the Constitution. So I think my hermeneutic of looking at the Bible would translate to my hermeneutic of of, of looking at the Constitution and being more on the originalist side I than see. say some of my uh, also Christian brothers, but. Um, that would be more on the liberal side of that. Interesting. Jared? Um, can, I'd like to give just a specific example. Say you had a, a protege who, were, who was you know, um, a lawyer and um, dealt with divorce cases, and there was a, there was a quote-unquote no-fault divorce case. Um, how would you go about advising a Christian lawyer yeah. to deal with a no-fault divorce case given own personal Christian convictions, but also working um, within the law and, and the rules and, yeah. and governance? And the there. ethics all involved there, yeah, too. Yeah, yeah. Uh, can I say? Mm? Yeah, <laughs> we have. I'm mm. sure plenty of uh, ethical mm. conundrums yeah. we could raise, but this right. is an interesting case because I think it gets to the gets to the heart of of the issue. Um, it, it does, and and of, I will I will answer that because I, I do have thoughts on that. But as chairman of a firm of 550 people, which I was mm-hmm. with everybody from neo neo communists and neo socialists to right wingers and a broad <laughs> spectrum of people all of whom were my partners and I owed a duty of leadership to yeah. you can imagine that there were many things that came up um that I personally did not agree with yes yeah. but that right. um I in the interest of 
of running a firm and a business didn't feel like it violated uh, my my personal beliefs. Here's a, here's a great example. The uh, GLBT group came and wanted mm-hmm. us to sponsor them mm-hmm. for Gay Pride. Many of mm-hmm. my partners, um, not, some of my partners are gay. Many of my associates were gay, and they uniformly asked me to put firm money toward the GLBT. Now, I thought about it a long time, and I said, no, I can't do it. If it's that important an issue, I will step down because that is something that I cannot do. It's, I just don't believe in it, and I don't want on my watch. I can't do it. I just can't do it. So I, my, my partners, all of my partners knew 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 me as a spiritual or religious guy because I kind of I tended to wear it on my sleeve. So everybody knew that it was going to be an issue for me, mm-hmm. and they, while they were disappointed. Nobody said to me, "Step down. You, you've got it. You, we're going to do this." There were a lot of people in the firm that didn't think we ought to do it. Um, so that was one issue. Tip, that, that was one issue where I was able to say, "No, this violates my personal beliefs, and, mm-hmm. and I am not going to give firm money to do it." Now there were other cases. For example, take the divorce case. Um, I have I don't do divorce cases, um, but. If my we we had a divorce practice, a very small divorce practice, and if my partners wanted to do no fault divorce cases, that was okay. That didn't violate for me uh-huh. any of my personal tenets. So I think I think like everything else, there's you've got to make some hard decisions that are not bright line decisions. Yeah. But you just go ahead and make them as they come. Sure. You pray about them. You talk to your. I had some good Christian friends in the firm that uh, that I that I talked to regularly about tough issues. Uh, I had a group of secretaries that prayed for me every day. Isn't that wonderful? It is. Wow, it they is. came. She came to me. Uh, the, the woman that ran the pool. She came to me and she said, "Do you know that six of us get together and pray for you every day?" I said, "Oh my, that's wonderful. Wow. That's the best thing I've heard." Yeah. It's quite a compliment. It, it really was. Um, so, so I, I every day I felt as I went into work. Um, after my devotions, the first thing I would say was, uh, you know, Lord, help me, whatever. There's going to be some tough decisions. I'm going to, uh, I'm not going to please everybody. Uh-huh. I'm going to make some wrong. I'm going to make some right. I may compromise my principles. But if you know, if you have a set of principles laid out and you consciously try to make the right decision, that's all you can do. And that's what I tried to do. I know I don't intend to pepper you with in, uh, particular instances, but along hypos, that line, let's do hypos. We have right <laughs> counterfactuals or whatnot. One <laughs> one other case that um, I I would like to ask you about. You, you you spoke about how your firm, for the most part, often was characterized by being or being on the defense side of things. Mm-hmm. Um, how did you deal with the morality or the ethics of defense? Uh, for instance, if you I'm not saying you did any any criminal cases of this sort, but let's pretend that somebody uh, who was accused of murder is asking you to defend them in a criminal case, and it comes out that you find that they indeed did it. They tell you under under uh, client privilege, lawyer client privilege, that they did it, but they're pleading not guilty. Mm-hmm. I mean, how do you? deal with is that something you would find yourself personally not willing to do or is there a certain duty you find to the law to give this person a fair trial even though you disagree and would like to see them personally uh put away uh good question um the answer is that uh as a practical matter most defense lawyers never ask their clients really yes they don't they don't they may know in their hearts but the good ones that I've talked to, because I've asked that same question. I've never ne- never had a murder case. Um, very little criminal law, but no murder cases. But most of them don't ask. They don't ask. They don't ask. That's fascinating. And and um, you can you can absolutely defend somebody even if you believe um, they have committed a crime. And uh-huh. the reason you can is because under our system, you are innocent, presumed innocent until yep. proven guilty, and the state has the obligation to present credible evidence uh, beyond a reasonable doubt of guilt. So now what I would do practically in a case if I knew that my guy had committed murder was I have an absolute obligation not to suborn perjury. So if he goes on the stand Mm -hmm. and lies, 
I have to immediately take action. What I would probably do is I would ask for a recess and I'd, we'd figure, I'd figure out at that point what to do. But I cannot allow a client to lie, and that's civil or criminal. So if I know that client is lying, I have to move to withdraw or do something similar yeah. like that. So wow. that's, that's you think that might be some of the motivation for not asking? It, pro- it, it could be. Yeah. It could very well be. The other thing is for, there's an old story of F. Lee Bailey. Do you guys remember F. Lee Bailey, one of the uh, great, 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 great trial lawyers of his time? He's for the name, now. but I'm, yeah. He represented the Boston Strangler. Heard uh-huh. of the Boston Strangler? Yeah. Boston Strangler was a was an early time ser- serial killer in the fifties. He knew, he knew Albert DeSalvo had done it, and so what he did was he worked very hard to get him committed, rather than mm-hmm. getting him to jail. So I guess the answer for me is if I thought, if I thought the guy did it, I would try my best to work out a plea on his behalf, get uh-huh. the best deal I could, understanding that he can um, go to trial. If he takes the stand voluntarily, remember he doesn't have to. He doesn't to. have to. Right. If he takes the stand voluntarily and lies, I have an obligation to do something about it. Mm-hmm. Now, what I would do would depend on the circumstances, so I, I can't answer that. And also, of course, in many cases, there's going to be an op- opportunity for a, a competency, mental competency defense, like, for example, Jared Loeffner, who shot yeah. the Gabrielle Giffords. I would fully expect mm-hmm. there to be... Uh, mental com- um, mental competency defense there as mm-hmm. we all would so you've got you've got a couple of things the uh, the uh, defendant has to be found guilty beyond a reasonable doubt does not have to testify about himself if he does he cannot lie or you have an obligation to do something and the government must be put to its test that's our that's the beauty of our system mm-hmm. it is it is so, it, it tends to work out pretty well actually yeah, um, the more and more I, I learn about and study the Constitution and the way our law is set up, the more appreciation I have for it. And I think that's the beauty of uh, being an American. <laughs> for uh, those who aren't Americans, I'm sure the, there there is some beauty and, and uh, grandeur to other law systems as well. But uh, It's remarkable how well our common law system and our Constitution has held up for 230-some uh-huh. years now. It's really remarkable. Now, um, um Another hot button issue uh, before we we wrap things up is the the role of the Ten Commandments, and often you hear about uh, them being you know a sculpture of them or some depiction of the Ten Commandments might be in a courtroom, etc. There are many different opinions of this, even within the Christian community. How how uh, what is your personal opinion of this, or do you have any uh, any ideas about the public display of the Ten Commandments? Is that a good thing, a bad thing, or, or how do we go about this? Very interesting question you asked again, and then I've got a story. I've got lots of stories, <laughs> but the Ten Command, the, the most famous local Ten Commandments case is the plaque that was on the Chester County Courthouse mm. back in. Um, yeah, it went on the courthouse in 1925, and in 2002 or one, a group, uh, the Freedom from Religion, um, uh, the American Atheist Association, filed a suit in federal court in Philadelphia before the Honorable Dalzell Stewart, Stuart Dalzell, who's a former partner and a friend of mine. And Judge Dalzell, um, with, with the county representing itself, and not very well, I might add, I mean, I <laughs> that, didn't represent themselves very well, um, lost. Oh, and the county we were lost. ordered to remove, remove it. Mm-hmm the plaque from the courthouse, at which time one of the county commissioners, a fellow named Colin Colin Hanna, who's a Christian, called me up and said, who's the best appellate lawyer in um, Pennsylvania? And I said, got just the guy. He's my partner, Alfie Putnam, who actually succeeded me as chairman of the firm. Hmm. He said, well, we need to uh, file an appeal to this case. Uh, So... Uh, he came in, met with uh, me and with Alfie, and uh, Alfie said, well, I don't want to represent the county because there's certain requirements of putting a record together and all of that, but we will rep- we, we want to file an amicus, a so-called amicus friend of the court brief. So we'll be the friend of the court. So uh, Colin hired another firm, and we became the, we be- carried all the water, and we wrote the brief, and Alfie wrote uh, really one of the 
class, classic briefs I've ever writ, read in my life, one of the great briefs, argued it before the Third Circuit and won the case. Hmm. On, primarily on the theory that it just wasn't a big deal. Really? Yeah. Um, the not a big deal argument. The, I like that. I mean, it's not crazy. <laughs> it's not for, yeah. It's basically, <laughs> come on, get a life. Uh, it's a wonderfully read, <laughs> yeah. written opinion. Um, uh, the judge, I've, I've forgotten who wrote it, but he was a remarkably prolific judge, and he died shortly thereafter. But he wrote the opinion, and essentially uh, the, the last line was uh, something of, to the effect of, um, uh, is this real or is it mere shadow, I think was the word. And he said, this is mere shadow, mm. <laughs> which essentially <laughs> said it's it's – it's just not a big deal. We're not going to spend the rest of our lives cleaning up our, uh, our, all of our monuments in D.C., scrubbing them clean, and taking uh, in God we trust off our coins. We're just not going to do that. It's not necessary in, in our society. Hmm. That's b- basically how it came down. And um, it, was a, it was a wonderful result in that um, those arguments, there, there were a lot of Ten Commandment cases going around. Those arguments have kind of um, gone to the rear. They're just, they just, they lost, the ACLU was representing these uh, parties and uh, mm-hmm. they lost the case. And it was, it was a classic win for Drinker, Biddle, and Wreath, I must say. But uh, hmm. on the other hand, um, I, I just think the, the level to which we go in this country today to avoid offending somebody is just striking. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, just think of the notion you can't pray in public schools anymore. Well, when I was growing up in a public school, we said the, said the pledge, we uh, read a psalm every day. Can you believe that? Read a <laughs> psalm and had a prayer every day, public schools. <laughs> and you could, couldn't hmm. imagine that today. No. Um, there were Jews in my class, uh, so we, re- you know, we tended to read the Old Testament. But we'd pray, and somebody might essentially uh, forget and say in Jesus' name instead of in the name of God. So that those sorts of things would happen, and that was just that was okay. Nobody cared about Christmas trees and creches. This is all, <laughs> this is all our incredible desire that we've gone to great lengths not to offend anybody. And I think ultimately, it's much more uh, technically written than that. But I think ultimately, wh- where this boils down to in the Ten Commandments is we don't have to go this far not to offend everybody. Mm. I think if you read the case fairly, that's pretty much what it's saying. Interesting. So, hmm. any more? No, just observation. It seems like, yeah, uh, culture is kind of going towards really one worldview, and that's secularism, um, and then every other religion is, is yeah. you know, just shunned. Um, you know, I could see, maybe you can comment on this, but another legal way of going about it is, you know, if you can pray in school to the Christian God, can you pray in school to Allah or, or you know, you know, practice Hinduism or something like that. It just it just struck me that that's not the way that the culture moved is pluralism. It was really secular no, monism. Secular. Yeah. Which itself is its own worldview, its yeah. own religion of sorts. So. Yeah, yeah. Well, this has been a fantastic discussion, okay. Gemma. Thank you for joining us. It has been a, a pleasure and kind of a breath of fresh air to talk about uh, a different angle on, on theology. So thanks for coming by. It's yeah, been a my great... My pleasure, Camden and Jared. This has been a lot of fun. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you uh, for joining us. And if you'd like to read more, uh, you can find uh, more information about uh, Jim's uh, practice, his uh, former uh, organization, Drinker, Biddle, and Wreath, where he was the former chairperson there. I'm sure there's plenty of information. I was online. the chairman. The chair. I was not the chairperson. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so nice. we don't want to. We we don't mind offending people. Right? <laughs> That's all right. Well, um, uh, of course, uh, Jared, you can find information about him and uh, the various work that he's doing at wts.edu as well as youtube.com slash Westminster Online and facebook.com slash Westminster Online. And Reformed Forum is available in many places, but the primary place is reformedforum.org. And there you can download all of our programs and find more and more of them being produced in video format. So keep your eyes open at the website for more information and uh, all of our new resources there. We want to thank everybody for listening. And and for watching, and we hope everyone joins us again next time on Christ the Center.